The energy doesn't just disappear. If we don't work with it or transmute it, it sticks, it stays with us. And what happens is an energy, like the energy will stick, it will find, usually it starts in your auric field, it'll, it'll, it won't get released. And then over time, more and more and more stuff happens and that reinforces the block. It grows bigger and bigger, it grows deeper and deeper. And before you know it, you've got uh, a blocked energy around a particular issue in your life. Gabrielle, welcome to Shifting Dimensions. Thank you so much for being here. How are you? I'm great, Jimmy, and thank you so much for having me. Dialing in, it's morning. We are on the following day. I'm living, you know, in Australia, and uh, it's great to dial in from the future. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because it's still uh, 6 p.m. for me, but this would be your yesterday. So that's interesting yes. how time works. So <laughs> part of the reason I really wanted to speak with you is because I think everyone uses oh, energy, it's the energy I can tap into, the energy I can feel the energy. So many people use that word a lot. I use it a lot too, yes. but I've never really had a conversation on exactly what is energy, how does it flow, how can we use it for good for ourselves and for others, et cetera. But before we get into that, I want to start off by talking a little bit about you. Okay, so you dedicated 27 years of your life to corporate psychology, and then a huge shift happened when you encountered a podcast that literally sparked a life altering shift as you would describe it. So can you talk about that encounter and what about it sparked that life altering shift for you? Oh, that's great. Love that question. Thank you. Well, um, there was a life altering spark or shift and a cat there was a catalyst to that and that's the case most times Jimmy because most of the time we'll just continue with the status quo unless we get something coming from the outside that says that holds up the mirror or says you know you got to steer course so I was someone who lived with anxiety all of my life from a young age and I happened to choose a particular particularly stressful career uh, in corporate. So what that did was it just amplified my inherent anxiety, the anxiety that was already present in me. And in 2020, which is when the podcast happens, I actually found myself at an inflection point. I was in a senior role at a bank here in Australia. It was a particularly dry role. <laughs> um, I wasn't just bored, I was desperately unhappy and I was also overwhelmed. So, you know, I wasn't sleeping. My thyroid disease came up again. Uh, I, you know, I'd withdrawn from everyone around me. And I woke up on a Sunday morning almost paralyzed by fear. And I took a couple of minutes out and went into myself. And I realized when I tuned in that I was feeling this dread because the following day was Monday. And even though we were in the middle of the pandemic and most of my work was done virtually, the thought of hopping onto a Zoom call filled me with dread. So I took myself off for a walk, put on my AirPods, and I listened to this podcast. And the woman being interviewed also lived with chronic anxiety. And she was talking about how her daughter, who'd once been involved in a bad accident, but who'd completely recovered, was now getting, well, she got married and she was now expecting her first child. So the woman being interviewed was going through an incredible experience in her life, but she couldn't enjoy the moment because she was paralyzed by fear. And she kept waiting for the other shoe to drop. And when I heard those words, I it was like a light bulb moment because I realized my whole life I'd been waiting for the other shoe to fall and I'd been stuck in an invisible spiritual prison. The bars, even though they were invisible, they kept me trapped in an ongoing cycle of anxiety, dread, fear, trepidation, and it was time to, to break free. So that was the spark that made me reassess my life and um, steer, uh, steer it in a different direction. It sounds like you're describing being woken up to your life, right? I think 
a lot of people get stuck in the rat race and they get stuck in the routine and the corporate world, like you said, but it seems like how you were living your life was becoming unsustainable. And it was, I, yeah. yes. And it seems like you were realizing that and you were guided, I guess, to listen to this podcast serendipitously. And it kind of woke up some level of self-awareness where you realize like, oh, this is, these are the patterns. These are the things that I'm, I'm constantly dealing with. So were you always a spiritual person? Did you ever, um, were you ever into meditation or prayer or anything to kind of ground yourself while working in corporate and kind of dealing with all the different anxieties? Essentially, had you tried other modalities to kind of help you ease that tension that you were feeling? Well, actually, I tried meditation. I was a terrible meditator. I tried it on and off for years and I just couldn't get the hang of it, uh, which probably is a sign that I should have stuck with it. But I was kind of in and out of it. Yes, I think I've always been a spiritual person because when I was young, I was eight years old. I remember having my first major dream and it woke me up. And I was young, I was terrified. It was like a phobia coming to the dream. And instead of turning over and going back to sleep, I turned on my light. I sat on my windowsill, took out my journal and I tried to make sense of my dream at age eight. And uh, so I was always interested in psychology and you know the, the mysticism of dream work. And then my father passed away when I was nine. And about a year later, I said to my mum, I really want to go and see a medium and she's like no you know you're not going and so I kind of put the spirituality on the back burner and um when it came to deciding on my career I thought oh psychology let me get into organizational psychology and for a long time it kept me going but the spirituality was like a background story and it kept popping up from time to time like I'd have experiences like I'd have supernatural experiences that I didn't want that terrified me that freaked me out and that I kept pushing aside but when 2020 came and I was in this terrible rut the methods the psychological methods that I used to use to get me out of those ruts and to quell the anxiety no longer worked so actually I needed I made a decision I, I needed to find a different modality and one that was kind of fundamentally different to what I've been using all these years. So yeah, I had been spiritual, but I put it on the back burner. And part of the reason I put it on the back burner was fear of judgment. Yeah, fear of judgment is a huge thing for a lot of yeah. people when it comes to diving deeper into spirituality. So I completely yeah. resonate with that. So how did you go from now realizing that oh my God, my whole life, I've been waiting for the other shoe to drop to diving fully into energy work because yeah. you know now you're an energy coach. So how did you make that transition? What were the, what was the journey in between that realization to where you yes. are now? Well, you're absolutely right. It was an evolution. I didn't dive straight in. And in actual fact, um, what happened was I resigned <laughs> from that job the next day but I, ultimately, I went back to the corporate grind as a consultant and I did, you know, ran big projects and it was still stressful. But I kept fooling myself that I was once removed, but it was terribly stressful. And so what then happened, I had a second catalyst because I wasn't quite ready the first time. What happened was a short while after that, my um, I had two pets, two cats. They were ancient. They were about 21 years old. And they died within six weeks of each other. And that was the catalyst because my fear and my anxiety, when I, I was watching them die and they were just getting more and more infirm, the dread and the fear, the paralyzing fear was back again. And I thought to myself, I cannot live with this any longer. My cats are going to die. I can't do anything about my external world. I've got to shift my response to it. And it was sh very shortly after that, that an advert came up in my Instagram feed. And there was somebody that was an unknown person that was doing a three-day weekend workshop. And I thought, 
let me just join it. it was like something like ten dollars and at the end of it I signed up because that person ended up being my teacher so yeah it was a little bit more of an evolution and then I still didn't leave the corporate world entirely because now I, I had to skill up I need to reskill and it took another 18 months for me to accredit as an energy level three energy master and then the shift happened in its entirety very interesting. You say energy runs the show. Unresolved experiences build invincible energy blocks. Mine was grief and anxiety. So you just talked about how you realized that you could not control your external world. So you had to turn inward in order to release a lot of those blocks in which I'm assuming you're talking about energy in that sense. So before we even get into what you mean by energy runs the show, how would you define energy? I think everybody knows what it means intuitively. Like I said at yes. the beginning, we all use that word. But what exactly is energy? Well, energy is life force. You know, it's what's known as the breath of life. And it runs through us and it regulates both our conscious and our unconscious functions. So like our breath, our heartbeat, healing, all of those things that are out of our awareness, energy is regulating all of that. Now, when we die, energy leaves our physical body so that you can tell the difference between someone that's alive versus passed away because the life force is no longer there. So just to go, like, why do I always say energy runs the show? Because if you think about it, it's, <clears throat> it's the power behind everything that we do <clears throat> it's almost I often refer to it as the invisible fuel that drives us and it can either um, rev things up like accelerate our lives or it can put the brakes on and keep us really stuck in slow motion the thing about energy and the way that we access it and understand it is it influences how we feel how we think how we navigate life. So we start to see patterns in our lives associated with our energetic being. And um, it's so it's really is this invisible life force that determines how we show up and therefore what happens in our lives. And, you know, just think, could think of a, a simple example. One morning you wake up, you're fueled by positivity, you're motivated. Throughout the day, your thoughts are clear, your interactions with people are generative and uplifting, your challenges that you face are all manageable. Now, if you flip that to a day where you're low on energy, everything's a struggle. And even small setbacks become really overwhelming to get through. So that's really the power of our energy. That's fascinating how you put it. I think you said energy is the, I might be misquoting, is the life force within us yes. and around us. Yes. Not necessarily our yes. soul per se. It's a bit different yeah. from our soul, would you say? I think so. Yes, I think so. I mean, I think our soul has an energetic vibration, <laughs> you know, and all the things that make up our soul and our soul for being have an energetic vibration. So when you talk about, I think when we started the conversation, you said people often talk about energy and they say like intuitively you can sense someone's energy. The minute you meet someone, we've got a dominant frequency, right? So all the various aspects of our energetic being coalesce into this energetic frequency and you get a sense of somebody within a few minutes of meeting them, a feel of somebody, you know, are they well you know, well-adjusted, or are they needy? Are they anxious? I mean, if you'd have met me five years ago, uh, Jenny, you would have uh, thought that I was, like, within five seconds, you would have realized, like, anxiety runs the show. So, yeah, so that's the power of our energy, and that's why you can feel it. It's invisible, but it's very, very prevalent in our lives, and people can pick up on it almost instantaneously and that's what people are responding to when we meet each other it's not necessarily the things we say or the things we do but it's how we say things how we do things our energetic makeup you're absolutely right that's why sometimes you might be having a conversation and after that conversation with a certain person you might be like oh I feel drained 
doesn't mean the person's a bad person per se, but their energy was just so heavy. And you probably had to expel more of your energy to kind of balance their energy. So yes, I think, you know, many people use that. And and like you said, it's something that you sense, you can't really see it, but it's still tangible funny enough very. so it's very tangible yes yeah yeah it's very tangible which is fascinating right so now I want to talk about energy blocks right because I've heard that word used a lot of times like oh you have blocked energy here especially when it comes to Reiki which is a form of like energy healing for example so how would you describe energy blocks and how can people unblock their energy Okay, so uh, an energy block is, this is my take on it, it's like an obstruction to the flow of energy within the body, within the mind, or within the spirit. And these blocks can manifest as physical discomfort or physical sensations, sometimes emotional distress, um, limiting beliefs or mental stagnation, uh, dysfunctional behavioral patterns, poor self-worth and identity. So now we're kind of moving into the psychological realm because they manifest in a way that's familiar to us. Now, how do they form? So what actually happens is energy blocks form often in our childhood. And I know this is familiar language because this is what we talk about in psychology, but they, they form often in our childhood. Sometimes they even form when we're in our mother's womb. Uh, If she goes through a traumatic experience, that energy becomes stuck in us. And sometimes, like psychology, energy blocks are passed down from generation to generation. So for argument's sake, you know, if your grandparents had uh, money challenges, money blocks, chances are your mother or father, whoever is the child, will inherit those. They might be passed down to you. So they can even form as far back as then. So let's just use an example of something that happens in childhood. So if we we all have traumatic experiences as children, something doesn't have to be a complete breakdown of life to be traumatic. You can be teased at school. That's a traumatic event, right? And when we are young and we don't have the cognitive capacity to process what's happened to us, the experience becomes very... um, uh, alive alive for us and energy doesn't just disappear if we don't work with it or transmute it it sticks it stays with us and what happens is an energy like the energy will stick it will find usually it starts in your auric field it'll it'll it won't get released and then over time more and more and more stuff happens and that reinforces the block it grows bigger and bigger it grows deeper and deeper And before you know it, you've got uh, a a blocked energy around a particular issue in your life. That's the simplest way I can describe it. And that then manifests as common things, like I've already mentioned one, money blocks, blocks in relationships. In my case, I had a debilitating fear that was just stopping me from doing anything. You know, for other people, it's... um, you know, they're just there, you know, people who tend to procrastinate, can't make decisions, there's a block around taking action. It can manifest in all the ways that we know. It's interesting how you talked about, you kind of weaved in the whole notion of, like you said, you know, a baby could pick up the energy from the mom, or like we talk about trauma and, you know, the in the psychology world, the whole notion of the inner child, right? So a lot of times when I think about energy, I my mind immediately goes to it being a spiritual phenomenon, right? So would you categorize energy as a spiritual or scientific phenomenon? And the reason I ask that, because you're talking about blocks, for example, and I don't know if you've heard about, you know, like people do, for example, spiritual therapies, like past life regression work, or um, where they talk about carrying karma from a different life that could potentially be keeping you stuck in this life, right? And with how you're describing it, that also could be um, equated to a potential energy block. So I just want to hear your thoughts on, do you consider it more of a spiritual phenomenon or a scientific phenomenon? 
Well, I don't know much about, I'm not a scientist, but I am an energy practitioner. And either way, I think it's both. Because I think um, uh, Albert Einstein was, you know, quoted, there's some quote that goes around about him saying everything's energy. And that's the basis of quantum physics. So I think there is a scientific aspect to it, of course. You know, this pen that I've got in my hand is actually all it is, is scientifically speaking, energy that slowed down enough to manifest in physical form. A lot of the spiritual phenomenon that we experience, and this is where the energetic component of energy comes in, is what that is. It's high vib such high vibrational frequency that it's it's the frequency it's vibrating at such a high level that it hasn't slowed down enough for us to be able to see it, feel it, touch it. So I think it's kind of there's there's both aspects. I also want to touch on the idea of karmic blocks. Yes, that's a big part of what I do. I don't mention it up front because a lot of people, you know, that might be listening, it might go against their religious beliefs. And so I don't typically introduce it into the conversation. But part of what I do and part of when I am reading someone's energy and I sense a block, for example, in their throat chakra, I then have the tools to go and to find where's the root, where's it coming from? And part of that uh, inquiry is, is this a karmic issue? And yes, it can be karmic very much so. I've got um, tools to access the karmic grid and to just rewrite blocks that sit there. And I've got to use those very carefully. And I've got to size, so I'm always asking the question, is the client ready for this? You know, is this in the highest good that I address it? Because working at a karmic level has got real implications. Sometimes blocks, you know, in certain uh, cultures, people um, believe in ancestry. Sometimes blocks are ancestral. So, yeah, it can go back like it can definitely have that spiritual uh, tone to it as well. Yeah, I think it makes sense how you said that it's both scientific and spiritual. And I guess the word I, I probably should have used is, is it a psychological phenomenon? But I think scientific also kind of like um, encapsulates that. So I think that makes I think that makes a lot of sense. And to the point about the pen example, the way you said it's probably energy slowed down enough to manifest as a pen. Some people would argue that blocks or energetic blocks can sometimes manifest as some sort of an illness in within yes. the body etc so I could see that as being another form of that energy slowing down enough to kind of be like hey there's a problem here not all the time it's not a hundred percent but there's yes. a lot of instances where that does happen and I think it makes sense that you do include the karmic aspect the ancestral aspect because I just kind of think everything kind of layers into each other right it's like you're taking a bird's eye view and kind of seeing like how all of these potential pieces could play a role for um someone and so I am fascinated by all of this right but then I have to ask is it possible for someone to learn how to master their energy without necessarily having to go to an energetic coach or an energy coach or someone who's able to like read their karmic blueprint or all of that stuff? Do you think some of these things can be worked out by the individual themselves? Yes, I do. I do. Um, I just, I'm going to come back to something you said a little bit later because it was really profound, but let me answer this question. So you don't have to be an energy master to master your energy. Now to, of course, the more um, techniques, you know, and the more you study and the more, you know, the more immersed you are, the deeper you can go. But there are absolutely things that any person can do that help our energy. They might not be releasing our deepest, darkest blocks, but they can certainly help um, uh, with kind of rebalancing our energy, making us feel a bit better. And, you know, in the moment, feeling some temporary relief and, you know, small examples of that. I mean, you could do that preventatively or you could do that in the moment. An example of preventatively is I teach people how to protect their energy. You know, a lot of our blocks form from our environment as well. So uh, uh, just off the cuff example might be you might be in a toxic relationship with somebody and 
through that experience over the years, a block has formed around self-worth or, you know, just giving you an argument for argument's sake. Now, what we can do is in our, before that happens, you know, they are also in friendships and through the media and through news and through social media, we get bombarded with information that lowers our frequency and we can do very simple things to protect our energy from that and yeah a small example is you know digital detox or saying no to somebody um you know putting boundaries around you those are the things you can do preventatively to stop energetic blocks from snowballing or forming uh, but when we've got them there are things we can do to heal ourselves to some degree i often uh teach people how to work with their dreams we all dream and that offers us profound opportunities for healing. So really, you know, even small things like nature, elemental energies, really healing. So if you're feeling particularly stuck or you feel stagnant and fatigued, low vibrational, getting into a salt bath can help kind of release some of that and make you feel better. But when it comes to, you know, deep energetic blocks, you're probably better off working with an energy coach to learn how to really address it at that level. That makes sense. Could you go a little bit deeper in talking about how we can work with our dreams? Because I'm very fascinated by dreams. I'm a dreamer. And a lot of times when things are happening in my life, my dreams will mirror some of those things. I can see where I have the blocks and, you know, in a in a metaphorical sense, you know, sometimes when there's an energy block, I might not be actively thinking in my mind, this is an energetic block, but in the dream, I might see myself being afraid of what appears to be a monster. And then I conquer the monster and I wake up feeling, ah, oh, I'm relieved. I'm, I'm feeling better. So can you just talk a little bit about how people can work with their dreams in yeah. terms yes. of releasing stuck energy? Yes. Look, there are two um, uh points of view on this the the my energy teacher used to often say to us you don't have to understand your dreams to work through your blocks and I would think that's probably not entirely I don't entirely agree with that um, so there's that point of view just the act of release like you've just described you wake up in the morning you've slayed a demon <laughs> in your in your sleep and you feel a sense of you know release but I actually think it's really helpful. Uh, that approach really leaves healing to chance. What I work with and I teach people how to do is to actually work more intentionally with your dreams. And I think there's always benefit as a human being in understanding what's going on in your journey, because that also is very releasing. So uh, what you can do before going to sleep is you can just get into a really neutral state, uh, quiet, peaceful, calm. Maybe you have a bath, sit on your bed just before you go to sleep and then set an intention. You know, what is the issue that you want to resolve? So for example, you might sit there and you might say, because you, you have a di it's a dialogue with your dream state. You might say, tonight dream, tonight as I sleep, help me understand why I am so angry all the time. Just you know, I'll give an example. And then you go to sleep, have your dreams. And when you wake up in the morning, you've got a dream journal next to you and you just write. And I've been doing this since I was eight years old. And in the beginning, you don't know what's going on, just writing, right? And then over time, you start to see patterns. You start to join the dots in your dreams. And it is an incredibly powerful way. Because once you know what you're releasing, then you can do more conscious work to keep it at bay. So that's the practice. And, you know, in the beginning, a lot of people are not like you or me. They don't remember their dreams so the first step in the process is getting into the habit of it and sometimes you might wake up and not have anything you don't remember anything then I just say to people in your journal just write your felt sense when you wake up because that's going to give you a clue as to what happened overnight so I think dreaming is it's a gateway to your deepest unconscious world 
Um, and then when you advance your uh, dreaming practice, you can even start to lucid dream, which is very powerful. Because once you're able to consciously enter your dreams, like, you know, in your example, you would look at your block or look at, you know, the demon, and you would say something like, who are you? And the block might just, very often what happens is when you address the blocks in a lucid dream state, it disappears. Or sometimes it turns around and it's not as frightening as you thought it was. That's really powerful. So there are grades of dreaming and you can build up to really being able to release um, your biggest blocks in a lucid dreaming state. That is powerful. I love yeah. the aspect of setting an intention. Why am I always so angry, for example, or why am I struggling with forgiveness here? Or why do I seem not to have energy in this particular aspect of my life? That yes. is powerful. Yes. Um, and they're different, and they're different kinds of questions. That's a diagnostic question. You could ask predictive questions, for example. Okay. You could say to your dream, like for example. Uh, dream tonight in my dreams as I dream uh, please show me what life would be like if I took this job you know that's good uh, yeah isn't that interesting that is interesting you, you know it's just so interesting because you just don't think I mean let me see for myself I just don't think to ask these questions of course I pray about it right you know give me a sign is this the right next step for me to take but you know I think there's so much power in visions and setting that intention as well and before you sleep and saying what would my life look like if I were to go for this job or if I were to date this person if I were to move to a different state that is powerful I love that that is that's a really good one we've been talking extensively about the spiritual aspect of the work that you do and we've also acknowledged that sometimes people might not be ready to go a little bit deeper and look at certain things just because of the reputation of those things, right? Some people consider those things to be evil, et cetera. So if I wanted to work with an energy coach and I was worried about protecting my energy as well to make sure maybe the energy coach, who I guess would be an expert in you know, understanding energy, potentially manipulating energy, what would you say to people who were potentially afraid of their energy being corrupted or them being open up to low vibrational entities because they're engaging in a practice that they're like kind of iffy about? Yes. Well, actually, I was that. That was me. I was terrified. My biggest block when I was going through this, pro I didn't join this program to become an energy master. I joined the program to just get rid of my anxiety. And as I leaned into the process, I became terrified of low vibrational entities and, you know, what this may bring. I remember level two, when we learned about the karmic grid, I emailed the administration and I said, look, um, like, do I have to do this lesson? Like, and they said, no, 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 you don't. So I was so scared. So what I'll say to what I've learned and what I would say to people who were, are in the same boat that I was in is actually your vibration is your protection. So the more you work with your energy and elevate it and expand it, the less likely you have, uh, the less likely are the chances that negative or low vibrational entities will come to you. In fact, it doesn't happen. You know, I had really scary experiences before I started this process. And I guess that's what made me really terrified. And what you learn is you learn how to protect your energy in sleep, in your waking days. I teach people, I mean, simple, simple stuff, like before you go to sleep, you set the intention. And I do this every single night without fail. I set the intention as I sleep that only energy of love and light can come to me. And so, but what actually happens is as your energy elevates, your energy becomes your protection. You don't need crystals. You don't need incantations because when your energy, your energetic vibration is high, the low stuff, this is my experience, the low vibrational stuff can't get in. It's like, it's like being in an airplane 37,000 feet up in the air you're flying so high if you think about the low vibration on planet earth even if they try to throw stones at you or they couldn't you know and so that i would tell people 
lean into it because you've got a greater chance of eliminating those forces from your life. I've heard something similar from a guest that I had on the show. Her name is Jeannie Kim. Um, she's a mystic. She's into so many different things. And I had asked her a similar question about protection. She has a slightly different take, but she said what you said in terms of, you know, everything is vibration, right? So if you are vibrating at level 10 and these lower entities are vibrating at one, they can't readily get to you. So it's about lifting your vibration. But I also think it's also important to envision yourself surrounded by light and and calling in those light forces. And speaking of that, you know, different practitioners work with different entities. So when you're doing this energy work, are you working with God? Are you working with spirit guides? Or are you just looking at it as energy and not necessarily tapping into God or, you know, yeah. different entities, yeah. however you define that? Well, I, every, you're absolutely right. Some people, you know, it is for them, it's God. For other people, it's the angelic realm. They tapped into and tuned into guardian angels. And, you know, for me, what's been really interesting is I tap into my higher self and the other person's higher self. It's a very weird process. So, and I can't explain how I developed that gift. I can't explain even really how it works. But when I'm channeling information, I know it's coming from my higher self and my higher self is able to connect with their higher self and determine the best course of action for them. So my source is my higher self. It's, it's very strange. Yeah, I don't it's need to go any further than that. Yeah, it's cool at a very, very high level because I'm going to have a whole episode dedicated to the <laughs> highest self concept because I still try to wrap my head around that. What is the highest self? Is that so, different? So am I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your, your elevator pitch, like, you know, literally 30 seconds. How would you explain or attempt to explain the higher self to someone else? Because is it the soul? What is the it's, higher self? It, 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 it's an element of the self. For me, the way that I see it is the we've got different versions of ourselves. We've got the human version of ourselves that's encumbered with ego and all the trappings of living in this planet and in this plane. The higher self transcends that. We've got a higher self. It's the version of us that's got all the answers. It's the version of us that is all-knowing, that knows how, that's got the solutions to the problems we are seeking looking for today it's the version of us that has infinite wisdom it is the version of that that's probably incarnated over and over and over again it's connected to higher realms in a way that we aren't um, and so we all have that higher version of ourselves and you know I am a believer I never I used to be an atheist I now believe in God because of my spiritual journey um, but we all have it. You don't have to, you know, believe in God. You don't have to believe, but we all, you have to believe in yourself and you have to understand that who you present in the here and now is not all of you. There's much more to you and your being is so much more infinite. The other thing that I believe is that your higher self, and I know this is not an elevated pitch, <laughs> but your higher self is the part of you that's connected to humanity, that's connected to higher realms. So it's the part of you that is deeply connected to spiritual wisdom. I think that was a great elevator pitch. And um like <laughs> it I said, was I'm about gonna... two minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I like it. I, I like I said, I think I'm gonna go a lot deeper into that in a separate episode, but that does great. make a lot of sense. The idea that our higher self is is the part of us that has this deep wisdom that we may not be readily able to tap into in our human being or in our human form. So that's that's an interesting concept. But it's yes. interesting that you mentioned that you were an atheist before your journey into energy work. And I was going to ask a question about what did you believe prior to the work that you're doing? I know you said that you had spiritual en encounters, but I'm surprised that you had those encounters, but you were still an atheist at some point in your life before now. I assume you're not an yeah. atheist anymore. I don't know if you're subscribed to a particular religion, but 
I assume you now believe in God. Well, I grew up in the Jewish faith, although I came from a family who are not one bit religious and my mother doesn't believe in God. And, you know, so there was the cultural element, but no, nothing to do with religion. I want to just say that I want, I don't think I was atheist. I was probably more agnostic. I wasn't like a rabbit. I just, I just, because life had let me down so much, I couldn't believe there was a benevolent force that was there to support me. What happened in my spiritual journey is as I started getting into a dialogue with the universe through simple practice, like setting intentions, watching, you know, synchronicities unfold and, you know, talking more to my dreams, that stuff. Then I realized actually that um, the universe wants us to succeed it's not out there to get us the universe god or you know the the higher force and so i think um that's been a big big thing that has shifted is that the past belief was not so much that god doesn't exist but god grew tired of god god let me down i don't believe in this nonsense that kind of stuff to understanding through dialogue that actually the universe wants to support you. I think that was a really, really big shift. The other big shift that happened when I was going through my spiritual journey was a whole lot of beliefs around anxiety started to shift because my dad passed away when I was nine. He was, I think, 48 at the time. He was at the prime of his career. He was a world-renowned professor of medicine. And um, I had a belief that uh, he was in the prime of his career. My belief, which is linked to the universe lets you down, is that you can't have it all, you know? And because if you have it all, then it's going to hit the fan. Something's going to come to give you a whack and to teach you a lesson. And that's all shifted. And now it's, you know, not about having, you know, having it all. It's not a scale where one thing's working, so therefore other things don't work in your life. The universe is not working against us. We're working against ourselves. And so that's been a big awakening for me. Thank you for sharing that story. What, what a profound story. I think what you said, I think a lot of people can resonate with, right? Which is this notion of you can't have it all. And I find myself doing this thing where I'm like, nothing's wrong in my life. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. So even in you saying that, I think a lot of people feel that way subconsciously because we know life can be tough and we know it's random and things happen that are unfortunate. So when nothing's happening and it just seems like you're, you know, coasting, it's like you're constantly holding your breath. And I'm consciously and constantly trying to work through that. But I know you've talked so much about your journey, but what tips would you give to people who have that ideology that you can't have it all, right? Like you said, it's not so much about having it all. It's about the process of life. So I guess the better question is, what do you think the purpose of life is and how can people be intentional, allow themselves to have joy and also still understand that, you know, excuse my language, shit hits the fan sometimes. Yes. the shit. I, I whispered that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jimmy, I think oh, it's so different for everyone. You, you know, I'm not a believer that you can just replace one limiting belief with a nice little affirmation. It's got to feel authentic. So at some level, you've got to go through a process where you shift it out of that belief system. Um, but ultimately, it's all around, and this is where the psychology piece is so helpful in a spiritual journey. It's about digging. It's really kind of excavating and getting to really understand what's sitting behind. Firstly, you've got to be aware that you've got the belief. So that's the first step. And the step, the second step is once you uncover this belief, like what is it about? And most times when you look at these beliefs and you understand where they come from, they lose their potency. They actually evaporate because they're very easy to debunk. And for me, one of the most magical parts of any healing journey or change or transformation journey are those in moments of insight where you have an aha where you realize shit I got this belief and this is where it comes from it's there's such relief and release in that that 
you often, once you stumble upon it and you excavate to the level of understanding why, you then, you could, you release it in and of itself. And there's a very simple tool that we use often in corporates, you know, the five whys. Ask yourself why, 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 and get, once you ask the fifth why, you often get to the root of an issue. I love that. And what you said was just so profound. Once you realize where that limiting belief is coming from or where that stuck energy is, it does allow you to be like, oh, okay, I, I know why I get triggered by this. This is exactly what's happening that's causing that trigger. And then all of a sudden, the trigger becomes so small because now you know exactly the root cause or the reason yes. why you're being triggered that way. So and then, I- look I hit. No, you, you go. I'm good. Now, I understand that once you know your triggers, you can interrupt them if they return. You know, there are, there are psychological and, and energetic ways of interrupting the trigger and the downward spiral and catching it before it blows up again. So the awareness has so many benefits. Yes, absolutely. So do you think that there's a correlation between psychology and spirituality? Do you think they can bleed into each other have you ever thought about that I most certainly do believe that and I most certainly have thought about it I would, I would describe my practice as east meets west you know where we are dealing with um, modern contemporary psychological challenges in a spiritual framework but you know I think firstly there's a I don't know if you're aware of the field of transpersonal psychology which is the field that's dedicated to understanding the intersection of psychology and spirituality. And it focuses on experiences, spiritual experiences that transcend the individual's ego. So there's that whole body of work that is dedicated to the coming together of spirituality and psychology. And Carl Jung, who most of us know, he was, you know, the father of, you know, uh, analytical psychology. He explored spiritual and mystical experiences in his work in dream work um, but he also brought about the notion of the collective unconscious which is very very similar to um, the uh, spiritual notion that we're all fundamentally one so there's a particular there are theorists that focus on that but if you think about regular forms of psychotherapy like psychodynamic therapy um there are plenty of commonalities with spirituality firstly they both pathways to purpose and meaning so psychology may explore meaning and purpose through the lens of identity and self-actualization and all of that stuff but spirituality might address it in a a little bit of a different way like higher purpose or connecting with something greater than yourself but they're both pathways to purpose and meaning the other similarity is that they both offer techniques and practices that for managing stress and anxiety and other psychological challenges which is what I referred to when I started talking and so you know there are lots of bleeding over really they are yeah I can imagine that there's a lot of overlap and you know even before mm -hmm. I ask you the question I kind of felt intuitively, I didn't know, I think I knew that there was a, a specific discipline within psychology dedicated to the intersection of spirituality and psychology. I had heard of it before in the past, but you saying it now kind of um, reawoke that memory or that understanding. So I, I need to do even deeper research into that. So thank you for breaking that down so seamlessly. So I do have to ask this question and it has to yeah. do around, it has, it centers on the topic of manifestation. So you know how people say um, your energy flows where your intention is, but then now we're also talking about energetic blocks, right? So if you're blocked in a specific area and you're trying to manifest more money, for example, but you're blocked in the area of finances, are you still able to manifest? So I guess that's a, that's a, long-winded question I'll simplify it for you how does energy work relate to manifestation well you said it earlier you spoke about uh, I think you gave the example of if you're if you're vibrating at a level 10 and something else is vibrating at level one it's difficult for it to match it so the vibrational frequency like attracts light so if you're at a high vibrational level 10 and you're wanting a level 10 experience in life whatever that may be you've got a far greater chance of bringing that to fruition 
if you're vibrating high. What I have noticed with myself and other people is even if you're vibrating low, you can still manifest. The problem is because your vibration is high, you can't hold on to it. So you can attract it potentially in, but you can't integrate the experience or hold on to it because energetically you don't have the capacity for that. You're not vibrating at the high enough level. So there are times where you can, like I'll give you an example. Um, with you know money or let, let's look at it, let's look at relationships you might have relationship blocks doesn't mean you're not going to get into relationships it might mean that you just have terrible relationships that take you nowhere you know so uh you can you can attract something but it's not going to be of the caliber and a and also if it's something good that you attract like for example if you win the lottery and you've got money blocks then you're going to probably land up spending all that money and use it anyway yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for explaining that. There was something yes. you said that you wanted to respond to earlier. Oh, you know what I wanted to talk about? You were talking about when people drain you. You know, sometimes this is right at the beginning. You said something about, you know, sometimes when people drain you, uh, you're in their energy and you're trying to rebalance and recalibrate the energy. I wonder if you just clarify a little bit about what's happening there. So if you're in someone's presence and you walk away feeling drained, what's actually happening is it's not so much you're trying to rebalance, but you're absorbing the energy. We've got energetic cords that connect us to other people and to everything around us. They're invisible, but energy is flowing in and flowing out and flowing in. So what's happening is if you're in contact with someone who is low vibrational, if you're not protecting your energy, you can actually unwittingly absorb their energy. So I think there's a big difference between trying to rebalance energy and actually drawing in someone's negative energy. Thank you field. so much. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. explaining that. That makes a lot of sense. And it triggered one under other question I have to ask. So people talk about this notion of soul ties, right? Especially yes. when it comes to romantic relationships. Like if you, mm -hmm. you know, give yourself to too many people, you're tied to them and their energy is influencing yours and you're, or they're, you're tied to them in a way where you can't move forward in a certain way. Then I was listening to another podcast and they explained the notion of energetic courting, which I kind of resonated more to than soul ties. Um, and it's this notion that we form an energetic cord with everyone we come across or talk to, but some are a lot weaker than others and some are a lot stronger than others and you don't necessarily have to be in a romantic relationship with someone to have a strong energetic courting so is that a thing is energetic courting a thing and yes. and how does it work in in your opinion yes i think exactly as you said it i think there are degrees of courting there's positive and negative courting you know and then if it's a negative cord you really if it's positive you kind of don't really notice much but if it's negative you start to see stuff so I think the people who we've got so-called soul ties with you know we've probably got a really strong and meaningful and deep energetic tie that goes back a long time and there could also be a, a block in that cording in that tie that we need to learn to sever and that's what energetic uh, work uh, releasing energetic cords is about is it's about severing unhealthy ties that go back a long time or that have just happened so that they don't develop into something bigger but I think you said it all I couldn't say it any better oh okay thank you so and and we can release energetic cordings we don't have to be stuck to it we can release no. those yes. ties and can we do it yes. ourselves or do we need a practitioner for that Oh, there's a simple way you can release cords. I mean, I teach it to people, but alternatively, what you can do is you can act everything, you know, the power, intention trumps everything in the energy world. So if you get into the right state and you're in a really heartfelt, clear, authentic space and you set a, an intention, I set the intention to release any low vibrational energy in my connection with Jimmy, <laughs> for example, right? And you set that intention and you ask if that's sometimes enough, although there are techniques for cutting cords as well, if that doesn't help. Okay. Thank you. That's, I think this is a great way to kind of wrap up the conversation. We kind of yes. went 
all over with it, but I appreciate you for, you know, educating me because there's a lot I didn't know when it comes to energy. Like I use it a lot and I understand it at a very high level, but thank you for kind of illuminating these other aspects of energy and energy flow. And I'm sure that there, we could go down more rabbit holes, but <laughs> this is a pretty good conversation. Um, so I have to ask you for, uh, you know, just one last question, which is a fun question I ask all my guests, which is, have you shifted in perspective on anything lately? And it could be super lighthearted. Maybe you started a new diet or it could be as deep as you want it to be. You know, you said about diet, I'm going to keep it really superficial. Six months ago, I stopped eating sugar and I realized I had, I was addicted to sugar. So I think, um, yeah, my I just a big awakening around um, what we put into ourselves and the temple that's our body and how mindful and intentional we need to be with our eating. Uh, that's a good one. I I think I need to let go of sugar as well. I think a lot of people can relate to that. <laughs> so I had congrats a, I had on making addiction. that shift. Thank you. I have the occasional cheat day now, but of course that's it. You know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gabrielle, for being on the show. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about your work or follow you? Well, to learn more about my work, they can get onto my website. I'm sure it'll be in the show notes, generativegrowth.com.au. And that's where you find out all about my work, how I work, what are my offerings. You can also hop onto a 30-minute call with me, no obligations. Uh, and then the way to kind of follow me is, I think the best way is on Instagram, gabrielle.pimstone. Thank you so much for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. <laughs>